Roberto, are you there? Um. Welcome, everyone, uh, to this week's Friday lecture, and thank you for joining us through our uh, YouTube live stream. I'm Alberto Diaz Calleros, director of the Center for Latin American Studies here at Stanford University. Uh, since this webinar is going to be live streamed on our class YouTube page, it will continue to be available um, to rewatch once the live stream ends. Uh, please note that there is uh, automatic captioning, which is available by clicking the CC option on the bottom right corner of the live stream screen. And lastly, uh, I kindly request that you submit any questions or comments you might have um, to Dr. Gostoni via the YouTube chat, and then we will make sure to get those uh, read to Dr. Gostoni after his presentation. Um, I do want to remind all of us, at least here at Stanford, that we are at the land and territory of the only original peoples. Uh, we offer gratitude for the land, for the water, and the air that surrounds us. And we pay our respects to the past, the present, and the future Ohlone and Lenape peoples who continue to be present in their homelands and throughout their diasporas. Thank you again. Um, for joining us in today's talk, which is uh, from Afghanistan to Patsingan, comparing counterinsurgency and counter crime militias in Afghanistan and Mexico with Dr. Cristo Gostoni. Dr. Cristo Gostoni is a research, uh, is a research, part of a research staff at the University of Osnabrück in Germany. He participates in a project called Determinants and Consequences of Militia Performance. In addition to his uh, substantive academic work, um, he has been a regular policy advisor and consultant for development organizations and international development agencies, um, several of the, of the German, the most important German uh, development agencies. And uh, specifically, this is in the field of subnational governance on local level security governance. Um, he has a very, very long experience and engagement with uh, research on the ground in Afghanistan since at least 2003. And um, since 2011, he has also been engaged in a project together with Beatriz Magaloni um, here at Stanford, uh, which is uh, uh, a lot of the research that he's going to share with us in Southern Mexico. So thank you so much for being with us, uh, Christoph. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, and please, you know, go ahead. I know it is late on your end. Uh, you're in Europe. Uh, so uh, please, let's, let's get started. Uh, Beto, thank you very much for the invitation, and um, I'm, I'm really very glad that I can uh, speak today, um, even though I cannot see you, unfortunately, um, um, which would make the presentation a lot easier, actually. So um, when Beto told me um, um, that I should um, speak here at this event and gave me the topic, like, you know, what do you think about um, something like from Afghanistan to Apatzingan uh, uh, to speak about uh, um, uh, militias in, in, in these two locations. I thought, yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's great. But anyhow, we have a research project which tries to um, address exactly these, these questions. However, as I started to kind of um, really um, weave into the, into the subject, uh, um, and not just basically repeating our, um, our research proposal, but, but basically starting to rely on, on, at least on the qualitative results and data that we have, I realized how, what a daunting task that actually uh, is. On the one hand, it seems that they are indeed comparable. And on the other hand, it is, it is really, really a, a, a tough task and we are very much on the beginning, so so so, so yes, I, I in my resume I, I I pose the question: Can can such disparate and, and different groups in and so so far away from each other be compared at all? And and I think we believe yes, but 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 it's but it's 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 tough, it's difficult. So so there is definitely a, a, a big disclaimer. It is it is really now, now working progress. Now now that I, I'm kind of trying to to, to go into the nitty-gritty qualitative details and differences and 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 the observations it, it's it's really very much just the beginning of a 
of an, an uh, of a process. So, so, so I hope I won't be too incoherent, and that you will still somehow enjoy on, um, the the afternoon today, the evening here. Yes. Yeah, so, so why and how can they be compared now? And I, I had to. Um, I think it makes sense to, to, to consider and discuss an, uh, the concept of militias a little bit. So, so usually until about 10 years ago, very often kind of the conflicts between, uh, uh, conflicts were very often um, conceived as, as having basically two, maybe three different types of actors, state security forces on the other hand, and the insurgents in, a, in an, an insurgency setting or criminals maybe in a, in a, in a criminal setting. However, there was a realization, and I think really um, the academic treatment of the subject really started about 10, 12, 13 years ago. I mean, a serious discussion of the subject. There is very often, there, there, there is something in between. And this is really an interesting phenomenon because to some extent it is defined more by what it is not than by what it is. And these are state-sponsored or state-tolerated armed forces. I will use the, the generic kind of term, which is not usually used in, in the literature. And, and I, I will speak about them as militias, but not everywhere do they, uh, are they also locally referred to as militias. And, and, and very often actually also in Afghanistan, they would reject being called militias. And, and in Mexico, the term militias are not used at all when we speak about um, basically counter crime. Uh, counter crime the armed uh, the groups. However, what, what, what is I think important is that there is indeed something which, which is not really state forces and it's also not really the insurgents. Um, it's not really the, the, the criminals, uh, uh, but something in between. And it is very much defined uh, by its relationship uh, uh, mostly to, uh, to the state. And, and as such, really, I, I think these armed groups can only occur and, and, and be present in a state context, in a, in a context of, of, um, of complete state collapse, for example, as for example, the Afga Afghanistan in the 90s, it would make really sense to speak about militia. So it's really this peculiar um, an, 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 an situation an, 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 they have act within a, a state context, but are not against the state, have some kind of, a, sometimes more often, more formal, sometimes less formal relationship. So, so it's really a peculiar phenomenon, and and this is I, I think I think what what what, um, what 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 is the basic lines along which we can compare situations and and, and these kinds of groups in Afghanistan or in in Mexico. Now now there is also a, we are part of a um, an, an larger an, an research project which tries to address exactly these. Um, and, and, and this question and this comparison, it is located at the University of Osnabrück and it, it, um, it works with the um, funding of the um, German development fund, the DFG. And it's, it's a cooperation project with um, Stanford um, and with the Poverty and Governance Lab here. And as an additional cooperation partner, we have an, a colleague from the University of, of Mannheim who has a huge database on on, on, uh, on militias. And uh, Beto, Beatrice and I have already spent several online hours in lively discussions with, these, um, um, with this team. Okay, so, so the main aim is, is really, as I said, looking at these two um, kind of almost an, an, an most different an, an case studies an, 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 uh, of, of militias in, in, in the Afghan and, and um, in Mexican context. So, so very briefly, we, we, we once again, after, after a longer discussion, we, we decided to operationalize the term militias as follows. They are organized groups of private citizens, non-state armed actors that use or threaten to use violence or armed force to promote the interests of a permissible, non-illegal non principle within the territory of the state. And I think this permissible or non-illegal is, 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 a, is a key distinction which I think uh, uh, other definitions don't really address in the same way, and it, it is, and this 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 is what sets them off from from um, from criminal groups or or um, uh, or insurgent groups. So, so it is it is they are armed. They are not really state, but they are also not not really uh, not not fully illegal, 
um, uh, per definition and um, and can use an, an, um, violence and arms and, and basically in in in, um, in contradiction to, to the, the state's monopoly of, of violence. The difference with rebels and insurgents and criminal groups is is that they are by by definition not illegal. And, um, that, that these, these two groups, rebels or criminal groups, are by definition illegal. And, and, and this irrespective of the fact that there is, of course, often collusion between uh, uh, government officials and criminals. Nonetheless, uh, uh, as per law, these groups are illegal. Now, there are different types of militias, uh, uh, which also makes the whole thing more complicated. There are counterinsurgency militias, this is Afghanistan, counter crime uh, 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 militias, this would be Mexico. And then there are counter rival militias. And, and, um, uh, we do not really deal with them, but this is, of course, an, um, an, an ever-present possibility of, of, of such armed groups, not just only being used to, to fight crime or, or insurgents, but also against political drivers, for example. And this is, according to, to some uh, 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 studies, appears to be on the rise, for example, in some parts of Africa. Okay. Now, now, as I mentioned, there's really a growing literature on on um, on, um, on on militias and, um, and in, in the field of political science and conflict studies. And, and if you have a closer look at it, you will see a couple of, of um, and, um, important names. Um, um, Can I interrupt Mokno, for a second? Uh, for example, or um, Kalivas have also written uh, on the subjects. And there are now at the moment two uh, large uh, cross-country databases on, on um, and one of them, the, the, the pro-government militia database in, in the new, at the University of Mannheim is one of our I think he thinks cooperation we're thinking partners. Right. Yes? Christoph, are you using slides? Because we are not getting them shared if you're using slides right now. I, I'm oh. <laughs> so sorry. I didn't want to interrupt you before, but I was noticing. No, it's perfect. That you sorry, seem, to be, it's, um, seem to be sharing yeah. something, but I, I'm I getting it. To, to, to share, but, but now I'm, I'm looking for the Zoom. Uh, it's in the bottom it. middle part. It's a bottom called share screen. Yeah, I, I know. It's, it's, I, I pressed, we tested it before, and then suddenly, apologies. I thought that I'm, I'm sharing it. I do share it, or at least I press the button. Huh. Let me. Christoph, if it says that it's being shared, uh, would you just uh, exit the share and reshare the screen? I, 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 that's what I'm doing now. Okay, so, so I, I start the presentation again, and now, now I again press the share button. Or, yeah, we've been trying to increase the volume. At least put it closer. Okay, is it good now? Uh, no, I, I think perhaps you're sharing your presentation or, or it's in share mode, but it's not being shared through Zoom. Because I'm sharing now, now screen two. Can you see it? No, it's still not uh, being shared. Okay, that's a bit odd. Now? Yes, now it's sharing. Thank you so much. Sorry. Okay, so, so the, the, here, here's where I, where I stopped. We have, um, an, 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 so really there, there's a an, an, um, growing literature and, and at least two, two an, an large cross-country databases on, on, uh, on the subject. Now, uh, I mean, basically, we can find really militias all over, and uh, uh, the place in several um, uh, contexts here, just a few, ranging from Mexico, uh, uh, Peru to, to uh, Afghanistan, of course, Iraq, we have uh, several of them. 
and um, and, and uh, amongst some of the, the the kind of the commonalities that we find is is um, that in most conflict contexts, um, relying on on militias or tolerating militias by the state is a a very emotional and, and hotly debated uh, uh, topic. Fears relate to, to human rights abuses, but also very much on, um, basically on, on, on the loss of the monopoly of violence of, of, um, uh, of the state. And just a very recent um, statement by, by um, an, an, an Lopez Obrador, the, the president of Mexico, an, an, um, basically an, an, um, came out very strongly against uh, the establishment of auto defenses to to to, um, to uh, uh, allow for um, for, uh, uh, for for an uh, auto defenses or vigilante groups to emerge to, to provide local securities, basically stating uh, you know auto defense should, should not be accepted and, and we do not agree on um, it because it, it, it is a state's obligation to guarantee peace and tranquility, even though the state is is uh, you know. And clearly not capable to, uh, to do that. And in Afghanistan and many other um, counterinsurgent settings, the, 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 the issue is, is or the, the, the debate and, and the, 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 the uh, uh, conflict is very much along the, the same line. The other um, um, big issue in, in relationship, which, which turns up again and again, in relation uh, to militias is, is the fear of, of them committing human rights abuses. However, this is very often, uh, you know, we find um, uh, government security forces also perpetrating grave human rights violations, but, but, but nonetheless, there is a fear that, um, uh, 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 that uh, militias could exacerbate it. Uh, and, and, and these come up again and again when, 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 when when discussing um, a possible reliance on 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 non-state armed forces. Okay, so um, anyhow, this is basically just just giving a little bit of um, of the commonalities and 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 w why certain forms of non-state violence can can be compared, I believe, in between contexts such as as Afghanistan or or um, and Mexico. Now, in the following, I will uh, discuss uh, types and structures of militias in the Afghan and Mexican context, and, and, and thereby emphasizing both um, similarities as well as, as differences. And, um, and, and I will suggest ways uh, or how, um, what, what mechanisms uh, uh, help improve the performance of militias with regard to especially abuses against the civilian population and, and, and offering basically security and protection to the population. And ultimately this should examine whether militias have, have a potential actually to, to, to be used in, in, in conflict contexts um, to, to basically improve the civilian security. So I will begin with Afghanistan. Now, I have been working, uh, uh, I first worked in, in uh, Afghanistan in 2003, and uh, uh, basically with, with the exception of uh, four years between 2004 and 2009, I, I was basically continuously working there every year almost. I was, most years I was there two or three times, focusing mostly on the North, East, but also working in many of the other parts of the country. So, so I think I know it really quite well. Um, the field work that I will be referring to is, an, 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 I mean, mostly stems from a, a robust impact assessment I conducted together with a, a, a colleague of mine, and, and, uh, plus countless smaller uh, consultancies. These were and, and these these robust impact assessment were basically commercial consultancy and, uh, contracts. However, and, um, with um, a uh, data sharing agreement that allowed us and, uh, to use the, the data acquired um, on, uh, in the course of the uh, of these surveys for academic uh, purposes. It was um, a series of of um, 
four, la four large waves of, of surveys between 2010 to 2017, 18. An additional smaller survey was conducted in 2020. So there's a strong quantitative component, but there's also a, a huge a, a qualitative component. Um, and while, while the, the topic was mostly focused on, on um, um, subnational governance, you also gathered a large amount of, of data on the general security context, and we use this as our, our interest in, in local militias deepened, we used it to publish two papers. So, um, it's an, an, and, and there's still plenty of, of stuff that we can make use of in, in this material. Now, um, let me just briefly address the, the origins of these um, uh, uh, counterinsurgency militias. Um, and they, they really go back to the uh, to the time of of, of uh, uh, the jihad when when different there was a spontaneous uprising and then different uh, uh, mostly Islamist political parties uh, took up arms to to resist first the the, the communist uh, government the communist coup and then um, later the, the Soviet uh, um, invasion so um, these these are basically the, uh, mostly the the, the uh, basically the, the, the Origins of, of, of the later militias. And, and roughly the, the, their organization was, you know, following the initial uprising, was a, was a top down type of leadership, and with the party leadership being based in Pakistan, receiving um, an US, and Saudi, and, and other funds, and, and large field commanders being based in Afghanistan, who had kind of local regional commanders who would then have. And a local village level commanders who, who would then have the extra fighters. So it was really an, an, a top down an, an, um, hierarchy where, where money, weapons, and so on flowed an, um, from, an, an, from the an, an leadership, party leadership in, in, in exile an, 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 to, to the, an, through the different commanders an, to the bottom level an, an, uh, fighters. Now, this, this is a little bit how it would look like. On the top left, you will see, uh, for example, Burhanuddin Rabbani, the, the leader of uh, Jamiyat, his famous field commander, Ahmad Shah Masood, who was uh, uh, murdered by Al-Qaeda uh, uh, four, four or five days ahead of 9-11. Of and he would then have kind of local regional level uh, 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 commanders who would uh, uh, command like areas like, like a larger valley or, or something like that, and who would then have several uh, kind of lower village level commanders. And, and this is me when I was still young in, in 2003. And on the right side is, is an, um, one of these valley commanders in, in Badakhshan. And, um, and here, this is kind of one of his uh, village level commanders. It's, these tough looking guys would be the fighters. They were already, it was 2003, so, so already for two years, they were not anymore fighting. And as you can see, they were no um, weapons. Now, uh, uh, this whole leadership style and organization is very personalistic. It resembles kind of a, a clientelistic patronage structure and with the basic building block being the, the commandant, as, as they pronounce it, and, and, and these fighters on, on the village level. Now, after the Soviet withdrawal, they started kind of an, an, uh, morphing US and uh, Saudi funding stopped. And, and, uh, the fight still go, uh, went on, but now, now they wouldn't receive outside funding. And uh, so they had to start taxing the population. Stir forth um, uh, occurred between the different groups and, and escalated bit by bit to, to a civil war um, between the different uh, uh, parties. And this is this, this state of anarchy actually and, and, and was the one that, that actually led to the rise of the Taliban in the 1990s who came up with the promise of, of of eliminating these, these fighting groups. Now, now with, following 9-11, the US once again took interest in, in, um, in these former jihadi groups, and I'm mostly disorganized, and, um, but, but could be revitalized to, to, to fight against Taliban and Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And it is in, in, in these kind of situation that, that, that funds once again started to to flow to the party leaders, down to the regional commanders, and, 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 then, and then to the bottom and to fight the Taliban. In the post-US invasion situation, then 
a new state was established. Uh, the party leaders and top commanders received high positions in, in uh, political postings and, and state and government positions and became kind, kind of top level uh, uh, patrons. Um, um, while, while kind of these very local, lower level uh, uh, commanders and, and, uh, mostly did, and, uh, kind of started to retire and, 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 and often fell into oblivion. And what I would like to emphasize that so far, really, this, you cannot really speak about militias when speaking about these armed groups. They, they, were, they were rebels and, 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 and insurgents against um, Soviet occupation. And then they were uh, uh, basically fighting groups in, in, a, in a situation of complete anarchy, uh, but, but not militias because this reference to the state was, was kind of uh, uh, missing. However, and, 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 and once the new state was established, they were basically demobilized. And then, and, and this is when kind of this, this whole militia movement uh, uh, comes up. They, um, in 2009 and after, the Taliban was already once uh, uh, nearly overrunning um, uh, 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 the north and south of Afghanistan. And um, the Afghan national security forces were, were, were really nowhere yet. They were not yet built up to, to any significant an, an, uh, level and this was the moment when an, an Obama announced an, an, uh, the, the U.S. surge in Afghanistan, bringing up troop levels to 120,000. An, uh, and, and, and it was also in this moment when, when there was an U.S. An, an, an troops started to build up. Afghan national security forces were, were still mostly absent. And, and uh, when an, um, and the U.S. especially, but also local elites, turned to these these former jihadi structures and and tasked them, gave them money and, and funding to, to build up um, uh, militias to fight um, uh, to fight the Taliban. And this is really, I think, the first moment, really, when we can speak in in a in a in a kind of a, a real sense of of of, of militias of, of Armed pro-state but non-non-state and, and uh, armed actors. Now, um, following this this uh, um, this initial resistance against an, 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 a Taliban overrunning an, 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 the state, we saw the emergence of two types of of, um, of Afghan counterinsurgent militias. One were, were the Arbakis, informal militias from 2009 to 2010 onwards very much established along the same lines as, as the jihadi and insurgents. Um, ragtag, no uniform, um, and, and, and money, weapons, and, and ammunition being kind of and, and channeled through this, uh, these jihadi structures, still jihadi structures. Um, and then soon later, and, and, um, uh, from around 2011 onwards, and, and, and there was an attempt to, to to formalize them in, 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 within the framework of the in, uh, Afghan uh, local, uh, uh, local uh, uh, police. And uh, as, as already now, this, this kind of somewhat lengthy kind of background discussion shows these were really an, an, um, a mostly top-down setting up of insurgents. It was US forces and, and, and the local warlord elites kind of approached the, their local level commanders the local level commanders were also seeking funding because um, and, and, um, because they, they, they kind of resented being forgotten and 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 and, 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 and losing importance. And, um, but, but there was relatively little in terms of a popular uprising against the Taliban. And I, with this, and I don't want to, to say that there was a support, a general support for for the Taliban taking over. I think there was just not, and, and this is maybe if, if you speak about later on about the current situation, this is maybe one of these peculiarities that that what, what the Taliban is at, I think it definitely not was was not and is not the preferred option. There, there was relatively little kind of concerted kind of resistance in, in, in the sense of a popular uprising against them. So it, it's it is kind of an ambivalent situation. Militias were in, in this, this context were set up from the top. An, an, an approaching commanders, providing them with money. Now, and, and this, this as I said, this is the moment when, where I think it really makes sense. It's a state context. They, they rely on, on, on 
on, on support, backing, protection, nomination by the state. And they start to interact and fight against the Taliban, but interact at the same time with, the, with foreign forces and, and with, with, the, with the state and with the government. Now, now this is how, how they kind of look like. Arba Kizis are the informal ones. Ragtag kind of tough guys without a lot of um, um, formal training and, and usually a an, no betting. The, the, the command structure very personalized, linked to political patrons, um, and, uh, and, and very similar to, to the way that uh, the jihadi groups fighting the Soviet Union uh, uh, were functioning. Um, their payments uh, was always a kind of obscure, partly relying on, on local taxation, uh, but also receiving uh, funds and political support and backing uh, through very different channels, very probably also kind of criminal drug money being funneled uh, 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 to these guys. Um, obviously, they are, they are less disciplined, less trained. Um, um, the command structures often rather intransparent, also shifting, and, um, and importantly, not subordinate to, to official Afghan national security forces and, and command structures. Okay, and then we have already visually you can one can see the difference. And these are the bottom one is not my own photo; the, the, the rest is and, um, and the AP, the Afghan local police was kind of a formalization of these initial ragtag militias. And, um, usually they took already existing Arbaki groups. And, 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 um, but once again, they were kind of built around, around individual commanders who were tasked with setting up um, an, an, a militia group. However, as a difference, there was vetting, at least in theory. And, um, there was training, there were uniforms, salaries, and they were clearly subordinated to the district chief of police, and 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 they, with this, they kind of slipped out of the of the of the usual direct command by by political patrons or ex warlords. So so it really meant a difference, and, and one could to, to, to some extent argue whether they is, should be, still be considered fully militias or, or not. But once again, when we look at Mexico, we will find you know this this, this ambivalence of, of shifting closer or further away from the state. And, uh, th this is something I think quite common with these kind of uh, groups. Now, just a, a lovely little quote, and I really like and, uh, when we ask in our qualitative interviews, and, um, and we, we received this uh, fr from an elder from, from Kunduz province, and, uh, this statement to the question if there's a difference between Arbakis and ALPs. And he said, Of course, there is a difference between Arbakis and ALPs. It is like a car without a number plate and another car without a number plate. It means that the ERPs have uniforms and the government pays and supports them. But Arbekis are informal armed persons who are not paid by the government. They have neither uniform nor modern military equipment. So, so it's a little bit like a, a car with and, and, and without a license plate. Okay, I go on. So um, and, and, and then, you know, we, we relatively early we started to be interested in, in, in these different types of of, of, uh, of militias, um, uh, especially since, since relatively early on we found, despite kind of the, the common uh, um, prejudices and, and, and uh, preconceptions that, that condemned them as, as being just a bunch of thugs, uh, we found that, that actually even many of our own researchers uh, uh, felt militias to offer protection against the Taliban. So, so, so we, Others were afraid, and, and, and then we also had repeatedly these, these uh, well-documented and clear cases of, of, of murders and um, robberies and, and criminal activities. So, so we so it's kind of an, an intellectual challenge to figure out like, like how they are. And, and then especially once we, we saw the establishment, the ERP coming up, started to ask ourselves, are they better or are they not? According to some human rights reports, for example, a claim there was very little difference between the two. So, so we used two mixed methods, uh, uh, published two mixed method papers. And, um, and, and we found that, um, that there indeed were a couple of, of um, there were a couple of differences between the two. For example, uh, generally the population respondents felt less fear from the AIP than from Arbakis. And, and generally, 
the average felt less fear from AIB and Arbeckis than from the Taliban. And, and, um, then and, um, the, and, uh, we found a higher perceived security contribution by the AIB than by Arbeckis, so, so a more disciplined force that, that, that is, is integrated in, into the general command structures and can be thus more strategically deployed. Um, we found less fear and higher perceived security. So this is so far bit, um, about, um, about the difference between formalization and, and, and informality of, of these militias. But then we also looked at, at the features of, of the communities and, and we found that communities that um, where local elders were allowed to participate in the vetting of, of fighters. And in these, in these districts, there was less significantly less fear and, and there was a higher perceived security contribution of both ALP and RBK fighters. So um, and this is a strong statement to actually conducting betting with um, local elders. And this was very much about basically saying, look, you know, th this guy is a, is a criminal, don't, don't allow him to, to be a fighter or this is, a, this, this is okay. Um, and then we found less fear of militias in more cohesive communities. We proxied this by participation in communal work, unpaid communal works. Um, for example, cleaning canals, cleaning roads, cleaning the snow off of roads, and so on. And we found less fear of militias in communities with a strong communal leadership. We proxied this by uh, an, an, um, how the, the local uh, uh, community development council, uh, uh, to what extent it was fully active or, or, or not. So these, these were, let's say, the parameters that, that appear to, to influence um, uh, communal leadership. Now, uh, time is, is running, so I think I will hurry on. This would be basically a map, and we can discuss later in the Q&A, maybe. On, in the last month before the collapse of Afghanistan, and, and, and we conducted our last research in November, December 2020. And, and here I could explain the presence or absence of militias and security forces, but I think I will leave it in case there is any interest. And then go on to, um, to Mexico. So, so this is kind of in a little bit of a nutshell what we found in, in, in the Northeast of, of Afghanistan. Now, going on to Mexico, um, um, we also conducted a field work there. Um, I am now relying on a, mostly on, on a field work conducted within the framework of the rural policing project funded by INL and, and based at the Poverty, Violence and, and Governance Lab at, uh, at Stanford University, obviously. And, and this is where I, I cooperated extensively with uh, 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 Beatrice and Alberto. I, Alberto is there. I don't know if Beatrice is also listening in. Um, and and, and the, my role was here to, to lead the qualitative research using basically a very similar approach and methodology on, 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 we used in Afghanistan. And, and at the time I was working at the Berko Foundation also in, in Berlin. Now, um, this research was conducted in 2019. And currently the, the current research project that, that I've mentioned is, is basically in many respects a, and a continuation of this original 2019 research that, that focused on the purely on Mexico, but now, now with this additional comparative an aspect of, of, um, of this Mexico-Afghanistan aspect. Um, however, um, um, my, my research interest and presence in, in, in Mexico is, is this further back. And, and the first time I worked there was in 2012 with with Beatrice in, in Oaxaca and Chiapas in, in, in those days. And since then I visited several times Oaxaca again, and, 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 uh, looking at, at issues of, of lo local governance and, and security, especially. So this is kind of, kind of the background. And, and there, there are, like at first sight, there are a couple of, of differences, but also similarities. So, so um, um, I think one of the, the big, Differences to begin with is, is um, that contrary really to, to Afghanistan, the, the counter crime militias, the vigilante groups, auto defense us and 
communal police forces that we find in, 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 in Mexico are, are basically, without an exception, basically bottom-up initiatives. So it was really never the state that kind of, of turned to local communities to kind of set up armed groups or uh, neighborhood watches or so on, because the state itself cannot deal with, with insecurity. But it was again and again, um, local communities, local leaders that, that um, started, um, um, that initiated um, uh, self-defense and militia forces. So I think this, this is definitely a huge, huge difference that I think we, we will have to take uh, take account of and and, and uh, considers. So, so very obviously, I think here we have a situation where the state probably one could uh, suspect does not perceive maybe the, the, the criminal threat as such a priority as, as trying to, to um, as, as seeking help from the population itself to some extent. Or it fears fears the population too much. I mean, I mean this you know speculation, but nonetheless, is, is I think really a, a, a key difference. Um, as in Afghanistan, we find uh, um, and um, however, uh, and this is a similarity. We find a continuum of of, of regulated versus informal uh, uh, militias. Um, however, whereas in in, in Afghanistan until basically the last year when types of militias were, were there were really two types of dominant militias in, in the Northeast. In Mexico, we find really a plethora of, of different types of, 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 um, of, of, of regulations according to particularistic agreements. And but first of all, depending on, on, the, um, on, on the, the federal state, but also within a state, we find very, very many different Particularistic and, and special agreements between and, and the Mexican federal states and 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 local vigilante initiatives. Now, as in Afghanistan, and, and I, I admit I didn't really discuss the, the differences in, in communal cohesion and, and so on. I just kind of postulated it. But in Mexico, we also find find huge differences in terms of of the local embedding and and. Um, and, and, and social control and local connections of, um, uh, of militias. And, and very roughly, this can be really subdivided according to two um, basically ethnic components. You find usually strong social control and strong embedding in indigenous communities, and then much lower social control and weaker embedding in, in mestizo, meaning non-indigenous Mexican communities. Um, and, and this basic difference, um, and, and, um, really portents and, and very different organizational structures and, and different trajectories of, of the vigilante groups found in these two types of, of communities. I just very briefly, and, and this, this is very a, a rough initial um, um, a, a, a comparison. I, in the following, I will term, the vigilante groups in, in Mestizo communities, auto defenses, and, and those in indigenous communities, community police or, or rondas comunitarias. And, um, this differentiation party or this, this, this terminology is, is realized partly on what we heard in, 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 uh, in Michoacan, where, where many indigenous communities and, and, and resent being called auto defenses. In, in, in other parts of Mexico, this there seems to be no aversion against the, the, the term auto defense. As nonetheless, I think this, the basic idea of a community police or communal police versus an auto defense in a, in a Mestizo community, I think this, this differentiation, I think, I think generally is, um, um, describes very well the, the, the empirical findings uh, that we have. <coughs> now, now, speaking about auto defenses, um, it is. The impression is, and from, from our survey and what we've seen in, during our research in Michoacan so far, is, is that they, they are usually led by, by local elites, and, um, cattle ranchers, larger commercial avocado, lemon, banana farmers, and so on, berry farmers, 
so 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 people with with, with an, an, uh, several local um, an, uh, agricultural workers um, leadership and control is 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 personalistic and funding by by is by by local elites very often these um, an, an, uh, agricultural entrepreneurs local elites put up a lot of the funding uh, of these militias um, and and this was definitely an, 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 an very typical of the 2013 auto defense uprising in, um, in Michoacan. And, and there were attempts to, to create kind of popular le legitimacy by putting up and an, uh, establishing citizens and, and uh, councils. Um, but but it's, and, and none that it doesn't change the fact and, and, and of, of these of, of the, the, the importance of, of local elites in, in leading these, uh, these movements. Generally, we find much weaker uh, uh, social uh, control and local embedding, but nonetheless, these were bottom-up initiatives in the sense that, the, that, that it was not the state or, or uh, federal state-level leadership that approached uh, uh, um, uh, these local elites to set up militias, but it was really on, on their own uh, behalf and initiative. And then, Turning to the other type of, of um, um, militias that we find, we, um, um, these are community-led. They build partly around traditional indigenous community police, um, but not the, even if, if this indigenous community police was already defunct on, um, when this community police was is established now and you know to fend off cartel threats and. Um, it nonetheless builds on a much stronger tradition of, of communal cohesion and, 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 and communal cooperation. Typically, and, and there is the supreme authority is a communal assembly, which usually has a, a still a tradition and, and, and it's kind of an, an institution in these and, and, and communities that is capable of, of making collective action and collective decisions. And, and uh, much stronger social cohesion is, is, and local embedding are typical for these, uh, these groups. Um, individual leaders are much less prominent than with the messy type of, of militias. And these two are, are once again, uh, bottom up. So, so, so there is a similarity between, between um, the, the auto defenses and, and rondas comunitarias, so to say. Now, in August, I, I kind of, I had a look at southern Mexican states to find out where we have militias and what kind of militias we we have or vigilante groups and and which turned out actually quite many such initiatives in in many different parts of 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 the area. The gray ones are mestizo, and the blue ones are uh, indigenous um, uh, militias. And so, so we have really qu quite a large, large numbers. Obviously, that there are much more. It's, it's. I think it's clear. I think that there are much more um, indigenous militias, and, and and much less really functioning viable large um, messi mestizo auto defense movements. So, so this so once again kind of underlines the, the better better organizational. A, 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 a social capital of, of indigenous communities as compared to, to, a, a, to mestizo communities. What we don't really find here, and I think this is really quite interesting that it seems that in um, mestizo communities with, without kind of an, 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 an oligopolistic an, 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 uh, an business leadership or an, an rural, Entrepreneurial leadership seems to have it very it's, it's difficult. It seems to be very difficult for them to 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 to, to org, organize collectively to set up auto defenses. There might be one exception, and this is Morelos, this, this small little part here, which is here. I have to better understand, but but it really seems to be like these auto defense movements, really seem, or vigilante movements in Mexico, seem to to to, to move along these two poles on um, in the, either indigenous communities. On, on, uh, with, on, uh, with less personalized leadership and, and on, uh, rural elite-led led initiatives and, and, and really very little or nothing in between. And maybe as a last remark, these, these um, 
these um, uh, local elite led in a, in a militias appear to be kind of more similar in their organizational structure and, and behavior to, to, uh, to the Afghan militias. Okay, let's go on. So here are a couple of examples. However, this is informal, formal uh, 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 dichotomy and definitely fits very well also to, to Mexico. Here we have on the left side, a uh, um, Mestizo municipality for, from Coahuayana in, 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 in the south. These guys are mainly funded by banana uh, uh, farmers, basically all, all large uh, uh, banana plantations in the area of, of uh, pay the salary of, of, of up to two, three um, uh, auto defenses. And here we have kind of, kind of a, in an indigenous community, an, an unpaid um, an, an, a local militia guarding a, a checkpoint is kind of ragtag, isn't it? And here we have a, a former mestizo uh, stuff after the 2013 uprising, the Mexican state um, was in kind of to some extent in a similar dilemma as the Afghan state in, in, in 2009-2010. There was this informal movement which they didn't really uh, uh, um, control. They were uh, the, the the government that the president was was ambivalent about it, and and at this moment. Uh, uh, in Afghanistan, they introduced the Afghan local police, and and this is probably a similar in, initiative um, in Mexico after the things in Michoacan were basically spinning out of control, and um, and, and they introduced an, an, a program of 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 of, of putting in, uh, these local auto defenses in, into a, a uniform police, which they called the. the and uh, policy as that fuerza rural, um, and here you here you have these uh, um, uh, these structures, but 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 it's once again kind kind of a, a rather similar attempt to to um, to kind of get get hold of it and um, regulate and uh, regulate it. Train it. once again training, betting, and, uh, uniform salary and, uh, is part and parcel of, of the same same program. Now, after two years, this program was was kind of abandoned, and and um, members were either disbanded, disarmed, or 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 integrated into the state police. Now, now what we have here, kind of another type of formalization, is um, is what we have in in. Uh, in um, in indigenous communities, it, it, it seems that in, in some indigenous communities, uh, uh, the state kind of made separate agreements, offered local communities the possibility of their rondas communitarias to enter the, the state police, but, but with the different structures, they, they would not rotate, they would remain put, but receive salary, training, and equipment. And, and these are two examples. In other examples, uh, they would, um, uh, uh, as, as in Cheran, uh, uh, the whole uh, indigenous governance was was was, uh, was legalized, and and they would set up their own uniformed, trained, salaried, and vetted, uh, um, uh, uh, vetted force. And here we have kind of this last one, which uh, which is is also legal, and then. Um, and it, it is in Oaxaca. And, and the difference here is, and, and this, this is once again a, a, a totally different form. In, in Oaxaca, as, as Beatrice and Beto have already been writing since, I think, 2007 or eight, and, um, and the whole tradition indigenous governance structure was, um, and, uh, was legalized. And as part of it, and also um, and, and community police was, and, uh, was legalized. And this really creates a, 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 basically a complete, is a, is a complete game changer. So we, here we have two um, local police in, in Topilas and, and sitting at the checkpoint. They don't wear uniforms, but nonetheless, they, they, are, they are legally like a recognized, recognized force. And, and as our, our research, research shows, they, they actually quite considerably um, and, and contribute to, to, to local security. Um, yeah. Now, um, 
here too we have initial results. We, we recently submitted a, a paper with um, Beatrice and Sarah Thompson on state evading solutions to violence and, and organized crime and governance in indigenous uh, Mexico. And, and, and I mean, I, I briefly summarize the findings and then try to relate it to, um, to, um, uh, to local vigilante groups. And um, so, so I think from this purpose, we need, we need to, we to find these indigenous up communities. Crystal? Yes? We need to be wrapping up very soon, <laughs> OK? <laughs> Just to let you okay. know. Okay. So, so yes. Um, uh, so we find indigenous communities. I have two more slides. So this is, um, should, I hopefully uh, this is OK, are more successful in keeping cartels out and violence low. And the indigenous communities with traditional governance, where traditional governance is legalized, are even more successful. And the qualitative results show that this is partly due to their capacity to organize collective violence. So, so I, I would interpret this as, as, as an indication that these counter crime, I call it our militias, and, and, and to stick to the, and, uh, this general terminology, are under conditions of strong social control, can indeed improve security and defend communities. And the second finding indicates that regulation that just simply strong social control is not, not sufficient, but, but that legalization, regular, regular regulation makes them actually more, more effective. Now, really as, as after this somewhat incoherent um, um, comparison, um, I would present a couple of first ideas. First, there is a, I believe that there is a potential for non-state violent actors, militias, to improve security for the population. This is mostly accepted, I think, for counterinsurgency settings. And, and I think here comes what is interesting. It is really not yet acknowledged for counter crime settings. Um, the, the key parameters for a better performance are, I think, and, and, and we should work on in, in the future to, to both qualitatively and quantitatively kind of underline this is state regulation and to understand how it works and why. Funding is key. That, that uh, uh, militia fighters and, and structures receive funding. Community control and embedding are, are really key. So, so any way of, of involving the community in, in, in vetting, for example, in the regular control uh, are key and, and this would, uh, uh, in non-indigenous communities, this would require significant social engineering or institution building. Leadership, communal leadership is, is a further key parameter, I think. And as, as, as the research of Beatrice shows, it's, it's an, the general governance context makes a huge uh, uh, difference and it's really a precondition, I think, for, for, um, for these groups not turning rogue. Now, what else do we find? Turning rogue is, is obviously a constant threat for militias. Um, without strong com community con communal control, this has definitely happened uh, uh, repeatedly again and again in, in, in Michoacan. Infiltration by, by, by cartels taking uh, over, in the case of Afghanistan, switching to the, to the uh, Taliban is, is, the, is a huge uh, challenge. And it was, let's say, and the last issue is is really sustainability, which is also something I think that the literature so far is not really considered and, and dealt with. And it seems that without a full state recognition, it is very difficult for communities to to, to support and keep up and, and, and these local self-defense militia groups, even if they they basically and desire their support, it's, it's, it's very difficult. In the moment the state, for example, this man that this, this mentioned, the EIP, it basically collapsed where, where, where funding stopped. And in some cases, they, they, could, they could shift to, to, to fully kind of taxing the population, extorting the population, but, but with this, they, they lost their, their positive impact. In other cases, they, they would just kind of melt away or, or um, switch to the Taliban. And, and the same thing is, happening in, in, in Mexico where, where 
and, uh, funding stops, stage recognition and, uh, stops, and, and, and very often these these um, these uh, these initiatives just basically fade away after after a, a while. So um, yeah, sorry, this is really very much a work in progress. I'm looking forward to the, to the questions and, and apologize for the somewhat not yet fully mature um, uh, presentation with which I, I answered Beto's request. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christo. Um, so, so this will end now our broadcasting section of the of the session. Uh, I apologize. Some questions that you might have in the streaming, we will make them available to Dr. Gostoni. I do want to invite you for our next Friday session, which will be on October 8th, uh, on security and illegality in Cuba's transition to democracy with Professor Vidal Romero from ITAM. Uh, so thank you so much for tuning in um, and, and have a good weekend. Um, Christoph, you stay on with us for a few minutes? Of course. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>